So, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to see you here. Some of you hopefully also uh, see again next time, and maybe we saw each other also last time. And you may remember the last time when we had the similar panel with Josh and Thomas and myself. Uh, I, I started the panel with saying, okay, let's breathe in, and uh, now I'm starting with saying, let's breathe out, because uh, last time we talked about uh, Terra, Luna, Celsius, and I remember I was, uh, I think I was uh, ending the, the panel by asking you, Josh, if uh, SPF uh, is the next JP Morgan, uh, because he's like really helping the crypto industry. Um, so I, I'm not gonna start with the same question because I think the answer is obvious. Uh, but I would like to start to just give you a, a, a brief two sentences about what we are going to talk here today. We're going to talk about regulation. We're going to talk about regulation from a global perspective and also from a European perspective because there is the uh, so-called markets and crypto assets regulation going to come. So don't walk out. Stay here. It's, uh, it's not that boring. <laughs> um, so, and uh, we, we're going to look into that, and we're going to look into that from different perspectives, from lawyers, from people who are active with their business uh, inside and outside of the European Union. And uh, yeah, and this is, I think, a very interesting because we have great insight. And I would like to start with giving the speakers the opportunity to introduce themselves, and then I will ask the tricky questions. So Josh, please, start. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Josh. Um, I am at a law firm called Linklaters, where I'm US head of FinTech and head of blockchain and digital assets, and I'm also one of our global tech sector co-heads. I've been in the digital asset space for the past eight years. Prior to that, I was a leveraged finance and corporate and securities lawyer for about 10 years. Um, outside of my firm, I do a lot of things. One of them is that I'm on the board of senior advisors for Wharton Cypher Accelerator, which is a non-dilutive um, accelerator in the digital asset space. And I also, since 2016, have chaired the legal working group of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, and I'm on their board. So that's enough from me. Hi, I'm Kevin uh, from Malta. Um, I'm a lawyer by profession as well. <laughs> but um, I, I practiced law for a number of years, uh, which my main focus was on advising clients on compliance, on regulations, and how to obtain licenses and to be compliant. After a number of years doing this work, um, one, of, one of my clients approached me to, to, to actually change my, let's say, hat and enter the market. And now I am CEO of Binayer, CEO of a cryptocurrency exchange called Kyrex. Um, we operate within the EU and also outside of the EU. We have different licenses and we're in the process of obtaining new ones. So this is a very interesting topic for us, for me, both from a legal perspective, but also now as an operator. Hello, my name is Thomas Nagele. I'm a lawyer from Liechtenstein. I started with Bitcoin 2011, started my PhD about the topic in 2013, uh, run a law firm in Liechtenstein, uh, helped the Liechtenstein government thinking about their regulatory approaches. Do that now in uh, several other jurisdictions uh, currently because now everybody wants regulation. Um, that was not the case a year or two ago. Um, outside of my legal practice, uh, I, I'm the president of the Crypto Country Association Liechtenstein. I'm a board member of INATPA, that's uh, the European Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications. Um, yeah, and all of my life uh, since uh, more years than I, than I can think of is dedicated to blockchain and DLT and innovation and technology and law. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm Oliver, I'm CEO of Bitrix Global, uh, which is one of the world's largest crypto exchanges. Um, but I'm also a lawyer, don't worry, I'm allowed to be <laughs> here. Uh, I spent uh, over a decade doing financial services, regulatory law uh, in the UK and, and Europe, uh, in the US as well, and then uh, quite a lot of fintech stuff uh, in the Middle East. So I, I joined Bitrix Global um, as general counsel, and I, I still maintain that role. Uh, and we're regulated in Liechtenstein. Um, we have our, our lawyers here, who's now contractually obliged to make me look good on this panel. Uh, and we're also regulated in Bermuda, so um, have a sort of global experience uh, with that too. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and you can be very honest and straightforward. No one is listening. Lawyers, it's not recorded. It's not recorded. <laughs> it's not going to be on YouTube. Um, because I'm going to start with the US <laughs> and asking about how the US regulation is now developing. I heard about Thomas, he's a very smart lawyer, so he 
was starting to ask about the duck test. So you take a duck, you tear it apart, you look in the duck, and then you put it together. And then in the end, if you can trade the duck, it's a security or how is it in the US? So Josh. <laughs> So what I would say is one of the big differences between the U.S. and a lot of other jurisdictions is that you don't just look at the digital assets and the, the rights that are ascribed to them. It's not just a matter of that. You can't just classify them. You have to actually look at the activity and the sales and the offer, the marketing. So that all goes into play. So your result may be very different from what you may find in another jurisdiction. And by the way, in case you're not aware, the SEC has taken the view very publicly for the past few years that nearly every digital asset offered and sold for fundraising purposes is likely to be a security. It means you should assume it is unless you have reason to believe it's not. Similarly, there's a lot of debate, and I'll keep this quick because I know there's a lot of us on the panel, but there's a lot of debate between whether something is a commodity or a security in the US. But guess what? The CFTC has said that basically they're all commodities in a letter to the Telegram Court in 2019. So you can have them be both. Just because something's a commodity doesn't mean it's not also a security. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Josh. We, we're going we're gonna to dig a little bit deeper later. Um, but um, for, for me, I'm, a, I'm a also a German lawyer and European lawyer. So for me, the law in the in, in US seems to be very sophisticated, very complex. Um, therefore, I would continue with a little bit talk about the European market. And for those of you who don't know, Malta belongs to the European economic area. And uh, I was doing some work in the past in 2015 and 16 when I was still with PwC, where I actively advised people either to go to Switzerland or to Malta to start their business. I think even Binance started with uh, some uh, office in uh, Malta. Not that many people know that. Can you a little bit explain from your experience, not just from a lawyer, but now mostly from someone who's really running the, the front business, how it is to, to do business from Malta? And is Malta like the gate to Europe, or is it rather the, the, the door to the world? Um, in reality, what is um, at least our experience with Malta, because we also have other, another license in the EU, is that the uh, regulation is very stringent and very, let's say, um, comprehensive. So to be compliant, and us uh, as a license holder in Malta, it is also a sense of, let's say, pride that you are actually obtaining this license and retaining it. Why? Because the thresholds, for example, are higher than what we are going to have with Mika being introduced into the EU. So in reality, we're already um, currently compliant with obligations that are at a higher standard than what is going to be introduced through Mika. I mean, we now know what's going to be introduced. And this has set us, let's say, into also a culture because certain licenses are approached as a way to start a business. I want to start a business, I want to a company, and I need a license, and that's it. The um, approach of the regulator in Malta is entirely different. We have constant visits, we have um, multiple, um, let's say, checks, both by the financial intelligence unit and the regulator, but also at the same time, Whenever we're going to introduce new products, whenever there is something that is not clear in the law, we find a lot of cooperation as well. So we meet the regulator on a constant basis, like they are very helpful. And therefore it has been um, a positive experience, but it created also in us a culture. Being compliant isn't just a set of, let's say, tick boxes, we've done them, now let's look at the business. Even the way we operate, even from onboarding, monitoring the, the transactions, activity, treating customers, and all activities, our mindset is now, uh, let's say, geared up to always be compliant. And that has made it easier for other licenses. Currently, we're applying in the US as well. I, I, I want to comment a bit, a bit about the US uh, legislation, because I don't feel it is, it is clear, but also different different states, different, so that creates a bit of, maybe Mika will harmonize for the EU, for example. Something like that for the US would help operators like us to, to introduce ourselves into the market. But we found that our experience in Malta helped us a lot. So it does open up also to the world in that sense. Thank you, thank you. I think it's also important to understand that Malta, Malta or the Malta business, they're not afraid of risks. Therefore, I think the, the, the gambling industry is very well known in Malta. And, uh, but still, I, I think that Malta is a good jurisdiction for, for doing or starting the crypto business and continuing the crypto business. However, another very good 
jurisdiction within a European economic area. Uh, as some of you may, Astrid and Obelix and the Gallian village, which fights against the Roman Empire, is Liechtenstein <laughs> uh, from that perspective. And before asking you, Thomas, I would like to first ask you, Oliver, is, is Liechtenstein the new crypto heaven or the capital for crypto business, or how can we say that? Well, uh, crypto heaven, God, uh, who, can, who can imagine what that would look like? Um, I think Liechtenstein has uh, a bunch of things going for it, and, and probably first amongst them was that they were probably the first jurisdiction to really establish a European regime that was fit for purpose. Um, and they got to grips very early on with establishing a regulatory framework that treated crypto as crypto. So it kind of goes back to what Josh was saying. The US is engaged, and other jurisdictions, are engaged in a rather unedifying conversation trying to categorize crypto into existing old categories. So is it a commodity? Is it a security? Is it a derivative? And the answer is like, sort of, kind of, maybe all of them. Um, but, but no, like it's its own thing, it's crypto. And the most successful regimes we have seen are the ones that engage with crypto on that basis. And Liechtenstein was, was probably the first in Europe um, and therefore probably the first globally to do so. The big challenge, of course, is Mika coming now and we're going to have, when the European Parliament finally get around to actually adopting the damn thing, uh, we're gonna have a situation where all 30 EEA member states will have the same rules. So that incumbency, that kind of default status that jurisdictions like Liechtenstein and Malta and, uh, and, and France, that goes away. Um, and so they're kind of in a fight for their lives really because you know, Liechtenstein is a small country. Um, quite a lot of my time when I first joined the country, uh, the company was learning how to spell Liechtenstein. That's quite <laughs> difficult. Um, and there are lots of, lots of companies out there that think, okay, well, regulation is the way forward. Regulation is what we're gonna be doing. I know the BaFin in Germany. I know the Dutch regulators. I know the Luxembourg regulators. Up until now, it hasn't been an option to go and get regulated in those jurisdictions, but now I can. So I don't need to bother with Liechtenstein. I, I can go to my normal friendly BaFin. I don't think anyone's ever called BaFin friendly, but uh, <laughs> my normal like, regulator and go get a Mika license. So it's a really interesting time because that incumbency, that default status um, is about to be swept away. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason why I asked you to speak first before I ask Thomas, because Thomas, I think he supported you in entering the European market through Liechtenstein with his law firm. And besides being Dr. Token, <laughs> uh, Thomas, uh, you have also great knowledge of uh, how the regulation of token is from a civil law perspective. I mean, what most people don't understand is the Liechtenstein Blockchain Act or the TVDG deals a lot with the with civil law aspects, but at the same time, paths away for regulation. And uh, I mean, you, you even did your PhD, I think, on, on that matter, and I think you have your publication even with you for those of you who are interested. Uh, maybe you can shed some light on um, how, how the civil law and the regulation from a yeah, European perspective must interact to have a, a proper environment for, for yeah, crypto business. Sure, so when we started in 2016, the work group, the question was not, uh, like uh, should we stop all of that business or should we just like create a marketing law to attract business and everybody wants to to come to Liechtenstein to start his crypto business uh, out of our country the idea was to define a strategy and analyze uh, this innovation first and uh, we spent quite some time to understand uh, how disruptive this technology could be and in which sectors and um, then we came up with the strategy and the vision of the token economy. The token economy is way more than just regulate exchanges or custody service providers. It's the vision that this technology will be used in our economy to digitize our transactions, to transfer value over the internet in a way more efficient way as we do it now without or with less intermediaries. And that's the efficiency game we were thinking of, right? And then we thought of, okay, how should we, where do we have to uh, change laws, where do we have to implement new laws to actually f to allow for that innovation. And that was the, the overall strategy with the, with, the, with the vision of creating the legal framework for the token economy. And then we said what we need from a civil law perspective is if you tokenize something, and we hear a lot about 
uh, digital art, NFTs, and then digital art representing real physical object art. N not a lot of people think about what is the, like, the legal title behind it. And Liechtenstein created a, a framework which I refer to as the token container model. So you can let a token represent, for example, ownership rights directly, for example, to Mona Lisa. So you can issue a token which is re representing the ownership right to a piece of art. And the interesting part there is if you then transfer the token, also the ownership right is, uh, is then transferred. So you become an owner. If I transfer you the Mona Lisa token, you're becoming the Mona Lisa. It's, it's a bad example, I know, but everybody knows what the Mona Lisa is, so therefore I would say everybody has a picture in his mind. So then you become the owner of the Mona Lisa. And that is huge, right? That is really huge because it's not only about ownership, it's a lot about, a, a lot about more any other right, like IP rights, and you can think of a lot of rights which can be tokenized. And that is crucial, because without that legal certainty, this will not happen. And, and that was the second part, we also said, okay, if this technology is able to do things which we anyway do for decades in a different way, and the risks are different, then we have to treat it different. Coming back to what Oliver said, it's a crypto asset, it's not a security, right? But if you tokenize a security, it still stays a security. So that was our approach, and then we said, okay, we need serve, if you provide, if I, pro if I do my custody myself, if I have my hardware wallet, and I custody my, my crypto assets myself, it's my problem if I lose my key. But if I trust Oliver, and I send Oliver my, key, um, my tokens, and Oliver uh, does custody, I mean, he's a service provider, I have somehow have to trust. It has nothing to do with the use of blockchain. He provides services for me. So yes, he has to get regulated. That's obvious, right? And that's not something new. And so we came up with a supervisory concept, which is very similar to the one we have in Mika, and we are actually uh, currently preparing for the Mika adoption. We are, we are amending our TVTG, the Financial Market Authority is doing the gap analysis, and our service provider hopefully can make use of the Article 123 to easily change your local license to, to a Mika license. I don't want to bore you with more details. If you have any question about that, happy to, to approach me afterwards. But it, it, it was more of a strategy and a vision of, of the government to implement that than just saying, yeah, let's have another law. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. I mean, uh, I would like to look at not just at the European regulation, I also want to look at the US because we saw FTX, we saw Lur Luna, we saw Terra. Uh, it, it, it all somehow is related to one thing. I, I would say I don't want to blame the US and the US regulators. Uh, I, I want to actually blame the missing harmonized regulation from a global perspective because what people don't understand is when you say, oh, FTX was not regulated, that's the reason why everything uh, went wrong. That's not true. FTX was regulated in Europe. They was regulated in Cyprus at a Cyprus entity. So they were actually regula regulated to, to, to run their MIFID business and they were even passported to the entire European economic area. Therefore, the European regulator cannot hide and say, oh, it's not our business, it's the US. I think the problem is that we have a missing harmonization when it comes to crypto assets. And this is actually what the uh, ESMA, the European Security Market Authority and the EBA, the European Bank Authority, already highlighted for the European economic area in their papers called crypto advice, crypto asset advice, so look at to these papers. Uh, and my question to you now, Josh, um, do you think that we're gonna see in the new future some more harmonized regulation from a global perspective, and is there any regulation coming in the US which is not just differentiating between security and not security, because I think this is very stupid, honestly, because we have so many other assets which are not security but still maybe need some regulation from the European perspective. Is there maybe some regulation coming for crypto assets, not for securities? So I'll answer that in a few different ways. One, I think that <clears throat> in my view, the likelihood that the U.S. is going to be harmonizing with, with the rest of the world anytime soon, I don't think that's likely, right? The S SEC and various other regulators actually take the position that they have extraterritorial jurisdiction. So if you are dealing with U.S. customers and you are in another country somewhere else, you know, or even if you're not dealing with U.S. customers but you haven't prevented the flow back or flow into the U.S. of digital assets, you know, the SEC and other regulators, they may think that they, they have jurisdiction o over you. Um, and I think that's something important to remember. Um, I, I don't see any kind of harmonization with the rest of the world yet, uh, maybe someday, but I think within the US, the regulators are frustrated. I mean, at least with 
folks with whom I've spoken, and I've spoken with a lot of them, um, and pretty frequently, just in their personal capacity, there's a, s a feeling of disbelief in many cases that the industry just isn't listening to what they feel they're clearly saying within the U.S., um, which, you know, your mileage may vary. You know, reasonable people may have different views about what is clear and what is not. Um, I will say, in terms of future legislation, and this is something I actually feel really strongly about, and it's maybe a bit contra controversial to say, I think sometimes the media and those who are lobbyists were really strong proponents of change in our space. Fortunately, they do have big voices, right? And they are helping to persuade certain legislators. What I think ha is not always the best is that there was a lot in the media about certain bills, very high profile bills in the US, which were very well intentioned, comprehensive, you know, and really well thought out bills, um, including, for example, the Lemus Gillibrand bill, the DCCPA, et cetera. What I don't think um, people necessarily understood was, and it took me a long time to, to learn this as well, is that these bills were not likely to pass even before FTX. So you had a whole bunch of people in the industry, including lawyers, skating to where they thought a puck would be, where it wasn't gonna be. And I think that that's very important to remember. I think right now, post FTX, and you know, you, you mentioned uh, Terra Luna, just today it was announced that the SEC brought an action against Terraform Labs and Do Kwan, right? So that saga continues. The SEC will come and get things even if it's a year later. Um, but I think next, if we're going to see legislation at all, which I, I think we will, I think it's gonna be focused on transparency and disclosure. I think the next thing that we would see from a US federal perspective would be about stable coins, right? Maybe something akin to what New York already has, mandating fiat backing and, and disclosure. I don't think we're gonna see things more liberalized in the US with respect to digital assets anytime soon. I think a lot of legislators ha are kind of feeling like maybe they have a little egg on their face because they received uh, contributions from Sam Bigman Freed or you know various other things. But I think SBF was very closely associated with the DCCPA and I think even though that may have been legislation that could have passed potentially of all the ones that were proposed, I think that makes it very unlikely now. Uh, so those are my thoughts. Uh, I, I think you know we're all moving forward but I think one should consider closely that the SEC, the CFTC, FinCEN, all the regulators, uh, you know, they really have felt that the actions and, and the occurrences, including the many bankruptcies, insolvencies, et cetera, that, that has emboldened them to enforce even more. So even though we're seeing a lot of enforcement actions, I still don't believe we've seen anything yet. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't blame the SEC. Like, their job is to be the SEC and regulate securities. and. Uh, and, and they're doing that. But I think you know, BitRex Global exists for the explicit purpose of serving the non-US world. So we don't allow US customers onto our platform, uh, regardless of where they are in the world. We don't allow people in the US, regardless of their nationality. And, and I think, probably unfortunately, the reason for that is until the US stops trying to fit things within a category that was created in, in 1933, like 90 years ago, it's quite, it's unlikely, I think, that when FDR signed the 33 Act, he had envisaged that blockchain would exist, right? If he did, he was an even greater visionary than people give him credit for. But that seems quite unlikely to me. So what do you do? Well, in terms of global standards, to my mind, I look at global meaning everywhere but the US. And we are seeing movement on that front. So you know, my background is advising traditional exchanges. The first place you go, CPS, SI, OSCO, you get the CPMI, the, the, the um, principles for market infrastructure. And so you know that if you're trading shares on the London Stock Exchange, on Deutsche Force, in Australia, in Japan, yes, there'll be local variations and, and imp implementation, but the basic principles are the same. I think we're now getting to a stage where enough countries and enough jurisdictions have actually got to grips with what crypto does and means and works and all the ownership stuff that, that Thomas was talking about, that we can actually move meaningfully forward on that and end, therefore, this regulatory arbitrage um, that, that has absolutely been plaguing the system. Now, you mentioned that the FTX in Europe was regulated, and, and that's true, it was. The biggest problem was, very often, people weren't facing that regulated entity. So these, these regulated statuses 
were held up and put into a trophy display case and say, oh, isn't it brilliant? I have 487 different regulated statuses. Oh, only 487? I've got 493. It's pathetic, right? It's, it's embarrassing that they were used in this way. Regulation has to be meaningful. It's about substance. It's about quality rather than quantity. And so that quality is what we need, and it's probably global standard setters. Maybe it's IOSCO, obviously FATF on the AML side, that will impose that on the rest of the world. And as for the US, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what you do. The political situation, I, I trust Josh, means that we're not going to get legislation out of them there. Um, but there's an old quote from, from Antonin Scalia, the, uh, the former Justice Supreme Court, uh, who was very textualist. He said, it must be fascinating uh, to be a judicial activist, because you wake up every morning and you think, gee, I wonder what's unconstitutional today. Uh, and I, I think there's a possibility that Gary Gensler wakes up every morning and, and goes, gee, I wonder what's the security today. Thank you, Oliver. So, um, looking at you, Kevin. So, w w would you would you agree to Oliver, or what, what would you see, like, say, from a from someone who's running the business? Is it easier to do the business in Europe, within Europe? Is it easier to face the U.S. regulator? So, what would you say? To be honest, it it it, it cuts from both sides in the sense that sometimes it's easier when everything is clear, and you know exactly that is regulating your operation, and you know exactly what you need to do in order to comply and that's it. Rather than having different, let's say, interpretations of, as we said, a law that's not particularly or specifically created to regulate the cryptocurrency, let's say, um, as for example, we're seeing now with Mika. What, what I completely agree though with Josh is that the, 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 the legal framework, because today we're discussing this, should not be seen as something that is regulating crypto, because this, this concept of regulating crypto is, I mean, nothing regulates really crypto. Crypto is what it is. It is more, uh, let's say, taking it from a consumer point of view, because getting a license, fine. You set the rules, you get the license, and you can work. And that's from an operator's point of view. But from the consumer point of view, following especially FTX and other stories that we have, we have seen over the past years, um, protecting, uh, let's say, the vulnerable uh, user of the trader, the, 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 the inexperienced or the person who is placing as well trust in others. Things like, for example, having adequate reserves for uh, stable coin or, for example, r rules against market manipulation, insider trading. These are all found within Mika, just as one example. So the law shouldn't just focus on did, did, did India regulate crypto as a concept that US regulate crypto just stopping at that. I believe that the laws should be focused on um, the user experience of, let's say, participating in this market and how it can protect the vulnerable, let's say, user in that scenario and how, therefore, we are not just complying, as I said before, to a set of rules to operate, but also ensuring that the, the rights of those who are participating within our business are being protected. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> I think that the problem what we face nowadays is, is not that we need to regulate blockchain and crypto because most of the incidents we've seen with FTX and Terra and Luna, they're not related to blockchain, they're not related to crypto. Um, and uh, even what is right now happening in the US, um, I, I'm sorry to say so. I mean, yes, you talk about extraterritorial jurisdiction and stuff like that, but at the same time, why do we need that for, for crypto? We didn't need that for, for the classical, for the traditional financial industry. I talk about reverse solicitation. I talk about freedom to choose what you want to do and stuff like that. And uh, now suddenly, because uh, we do not really understand what it is, I mean, people say, hmm, what is staking? Is staking something, some act, uh, act of like security trading or something like that? And uh, I think this is a big problem. And I think this is also the problem what we face uh, looking at you, Thomas. Just drink a sip of water because it's going to be your turn right now. Uh, what we <coughs> face when we talk really about, about what that we need on one side, I think, appropriate regulation, like balanced regulation, but at the same time, I think it's also a, little, also a little bit of educational work what we need to do for the lawmakers and for the authorities to, to explain to them what, what is the business, what is the crypto business you're trying to regulate here. I'm looking at you, Thomas, because you're talking now to other jurisdictions outside of uh, uh, Liechtenstein which want to introduce new laws, and I think this is also very important to help those lawmakers to do the right decision, and then we're going to talk about Mika because we all, all of us, we said something about Mika. But before that, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. 
you can you can imagine if you talk to these regulators, and that really depends a lot of like or some of them, they are quite educated when it comes to blockchain. So they have an idea, and some of them are really very well educated, even the, the, the lawmakers. But there are others where they now get just the task, you know what, the next nine months, you have to create the best virtual asset regulatory environment you can think of that's going to be the world leading best uh, legal framework uh, for, for, for digital assets. And uh, then, like this lawmaking team is looking at you and say, like, I have no idea, like, how blockchain works in like reality. I, I never, I never transferred a token. I never, I never, I never had an NFT or whatever. Like, they, they just don't understand. And the problem is, and I think that is totally true. You, you should, the regulators should educate themselves first if they are not there yet, right? Because if you don't do that, you, you tend to create legislation uh, which is using the same principles as we had them for, for decades. And for the service providers, that might be accurate, actually, in, in quite, some, some, in, in quite like some ways. But if you, the, the, the detail is the challenge where you have to understand where you don't need to regulate, where you have to understand that this technology itself creates the solution for a challenge and address the risks properly. And therefore, Yes, the I, I, I strongly, and, and, and actually it is possible, you can educate yourself. It's just, it takes time. And that is, the, that is the actually, f at the moment, that's what I hate about the situation. It was obvious that we were going to have, we will have a big scandal, but the problem with the scandal we have now is that everybody wants to have regulation now. We don't have time. We have to have our framework within six months, within nine months. The problem is that they don't take the time which is actually needed to create for a sound legal framework for, for digital assets. And uh, there is a saying, bad cases make bad laws, and I'm really afraid that this is happening now globally in a lot of jurisdictions. By the way, I know this wasn't one of the things that you said you were gonna talk about, but if it's possible, if we have a moment at the end to talk about staking, I would really like to hear from a US perspective. We will talk about staking. So we now we now have like six minutes left. We're going to talk a little bit about Mika and how Mika is jumping in and how we regulate staking in Germany or in Europe. Um, and then we're going <laughs> to also see how you do it in the US. Uh, but I just wanted to continue at what you said, Thomas. I mean, um, bad uh, examples make bad laws. Um, that's true. But I think that many lawmakers, because of a lack of understanding about crypto, they somehow all jump on reg trying to regulate crypto, but we have also other troubles uh, in the world, which brings me to the Mika, because uh, we had a good good start with Mika. The Mika is a, a draft law, which is for the la last past two years existing, and we had really good uh, communication with the European Commission, with Eva Kaili, before she just got um, <laughs> brought out from that position uh, as a president uh, of that. And uh, so, and uh, yeah, if you look at that example of Eva Kaili, for example, if you would have used the blockchain uh, for that <laughs> donations or for that uh, cash settlement, uh, we wouldn't have that problem. We can also argue from that direction. Anyway, uh, we, so the Mika, which is hopefully going to be um, effective with its publication in April, we all hope, yeah? So let's hope that's not gonna be postponed again. We'll bring at least for the European economic area some uh, harmonized regulation on crypto assets, uh, not on securities, uh, not on NFTs, but uh, on true crypto assets. And uh, looking at uh, the, the gentleman on my, on my left, you all are aware of the Mika. So would you say that once the Mika is coming, is this something positive for the crypto environment? Or is it rather something, uh, again, challenging and not the right step? Yeah, I, I think overall, my view is that Mika is a step in the right direction, or a big step in the right direction. Uh, when they actually get down, down to passing the damn thing. Um, and look, we, at Bidgets Global, one of our, our key principles is that regulation is an essential part, is a feature, it's not a bug of crypto. It's something that we need uh, in order to make the industry successful. Um, and it's something that, you know, back in 2013, 14, when Bitrex was founded in the US, was a hugely controversial thing to say. Um, you know, our founders literally got death threats from people saying, you know, this is anathema to crypto, it's, it's, we don't stand for regulation, we don't want it. I think in the last decade we've improved right. 
regulation, people, people try and say there's a, a tension between regulation and innovation. Are you over-regulating, over-strangling? Of course those are concerns, but done properly, and I think Mika in many ways does do it properly, actually done properly, uh, regulation can foster innovation because it can create an environment for people to innovate, for people to create new ideas in a safe, secure, and, and respectable way and that means that if you are an individual or if you're an institution and you've got risk committees to get through, you can actually meaningfully invest in crypto with the same confidence that you can invest in, in other financial services. So that's where I think we need to get to. Mika is a big step forward. The timing is just a problem. By the time it comes in in realistically 2025, well, that's a very long way away from now. And I, I, if, if you're thinking about... Um, you know, two years in the, in the future, a two-year horizon, I, you're, you need to be Nostradamus to have an effect there. And people are already, frankly, talking about Mika 2, what might come next. And so you're, what you're seeing, the opportunities, are other jurisdictions saying, well, okay, we're going to do it better and we're going to do it quicker. So the UK, Dubai, you know, all these actors are moving in and saying, like, the EU is really at, at risk of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. So w w would you agree? I mean, I'm looking to you, Kevin. I'm, I'm going to be very short. Yeah. <laughs> um, I definitely agree that it's a step in the right direction, um, especially for operators who want to uh, operate in the EU, and it makes life easier to understand where we stand and what we should be offering and how we should be doing it. What I definitely agree as well, that it's going to be a bit outdated in the sense that now we're already seeing an introduction of things that regulate matters that will probably be introduced in Mika too. Uh, but however, what I like about Mika so far, at least from what we've seen, it is doesn't try to control the market as such, but it's only regulating it. In the sense, what, where I completely, let's say, disagree is where, the, like for example, Canada's reaction to FTX and uh, stopping margin trading up to certain limits, etc. When the law becomes, I believe, uh, trying to control, let's say, that wouldn't happen on the classic stock market, for example. You know, when you're trying to control a uh, field, uh, let's say, um, the market. I think then the law becomes oppressive. So the law must always be regulating, but not trying to control, because finally it's not only made up of, let's say, amateur or newbies or there are also professional traders. It is also a big market, so let's respect it. May, may I dedicate my time to Josh and ask the question, if I have a duck and it's not a security, and I stake my duck myself, it's not a security. But if I give my duck to Oliver, and Oliver stakes my duck for me, it's a security. Did I get that right? So, well, let me just say this. I think, in my view, Kraken's staking as a service was an obvious security. Had someone done the analysis, they would have seen that. Um, I, I just think this whole rabble-rousing of the SEC is trying to kill staking is wrong. I have sat before, I have been with FinHub with proof-of-stake clients for years. Some I've sat with for years with the SEC. Never once was native staking of your own digital asset to secure a network something that was said was not okay. What is not okay is pooling digital assets, investing them without disclosure. That's what the registration is about, to give disclosure about the risks, right? And then giving a return that bears no resemblance to what that individual digital asset did. Now, whether Coinbase has a different model, which they're saying they do, this is all facts and circumstances, but I, I think we actually should be differentiating the SEC, at least, these people, they are very experienced with digital assets. They have a lot of knowledge. And I think rather than as an industry saying, oh, no, no, don't attack staking, we need to say, wait, this is native staking. This is more akin to mining, right? It's, it's for a consensus mechanism. These large enterprises that have staking as a service can defend themselves. They have lots of money, you know, and they can, they can do so if they do get attacked by the SEC and they do have a defensible argument. And then honestly, for the last thing, and this is very controversial what I'm gonna say, um, but I, I believe it, or I think it's at least think important to think about. You know, Gensler has come out and said with respect to one particular digital asset that previously you know, the SEC had indicated was not a security, that some of the staking looked like lending. Well, you can kind of differentiate that, I'm not saying that he's right, but you can kind of differentiate that between pr staking your native natively staking your digital asset to a secure a working proof of stake system with locking up your token and essentially receiving interest when there is no proof of stake system up yet. So 
I, I think we should be differentiating these things, and this is the very last thing I'll say. In our industry, a lot of times we have these catchphrases, which are very helpful in some ways, but you know, looking at, for example, another catchphrase, stablecoin. That covers everything from Terra Luna, right, and, and that, an, an algorithmic stablecoin that may even, the algorithm might not work, might be double minted, you never know from, from ecosystem to ecosystem, all the way up to a fully fiat backed. And that doesn't help regulators. That makes, you know, that makes things less clear for the regulators. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, gentlemen. Our time is up. Thank you for audience for listening to us and uh, see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.